descent of spirit into matter and its subsequent return to source is described both by classical esoteric teachings and by the major religions of our world. Theosophy describes the homeward journey to the source of one's being as the spiritual path or path of return. This entails one adopting spiritual practices and disciplines as a means of establishing union with the soul or higher self. On this basis, one then becomes aligned to the intent of the planetary consciousness. And the triumphs and travails related to the treading of the spiritual path are beautifully described by the symbolism portrayed in the lives of the heroes of world myth. And this afternoon, we are considering symbolism found within the Greek hero myths. Now, before doing this, I would like to, uh, I would like to outline the underlying metaphysical basis in terms of the study of myth. As theosophists, I'm speaking to a theosophical audience, I feel that this is very important. Here is an image of the British novelist and academic C.S. Lewis. He stated, myth is the isthmus which connects a peninsular world of thought with that vast continent we really belong to. If we look at the diagram of the uh, seven planes, the peninsular world of thought describes our, our thoughts related to the lower transient world of phenomenal existence, which we perceive via our five senses. This relates to the mental body. Our thoughts are commonly intertwined with our desire nature, giving rise to what Hindu teachings describe as karma manas, or mind contaminated by desire. The peninsular world of thought, which we see here. Now, the vast continent we really belong to, which Lewis is referring to, relates to the realm of the soul, the higher self, as the instrument of our divine essence, the monad. The isthmus, which connects the two separated pieces of land, relates to the Antakarana or rainbow bridge, which links personality to the soul. And the Antakarana we construct, we build through spiritual disciplines, especially the practice of higher manas or abstract thought. This represents the current frontier of human consciousness. Abstract thought relates to our capacity to think about matters which do not concern our survival instincts, nor the various fulfillment of our desires. By engaging in abstract thought, this liberates the mind from the desire nature. So the study of mythic symbolism, as well as the symbolism of dreams, provides a means by which we can function at this level abstract thought, higher manas. This allows our consciousness to traverse the symbolic isthmus. J.J. Bakufen, the 19th century Swiss antiquarian, jurist, philologist and anthropologist, he states, the symbol awakens intimations speech can only explain. The symbol plucks the strings of the human spirit at once. Speech is compelled to take up a single thought at a time. The symbol strikes its roots in the most secret depths of the soul. Language skims over the surface of the understanding. Plato introduced the concept of archetypes. Thereafter, the 19th century German polymath, Adolf Bastian, whom we see here, Describe these in his concept of elementargedanken, meaning elementary ideas. And Bastian made the distinction between the elementary ideas, the archetypes, and what he referred to as Volkergedanken or folk ideas. These were local historic elaborations of the archetypes as demonstrated throughout history by various myths and legends of the many civilizations which have appeared on our earth. Carl Jung developed and advanced the concept of archetypes or divine ideas. 
he emphasized how these divine ideas are represented within the human psyche as symbols. Archetypes permeate the psyche and our personal experiences. Jung referred to these as organs of the soul. They precipitate into our consciousness through the symbolism of dreams, meditations, religious and spiritual experience, and in true creative endeavors. The term divine ideas, as a theosophist, I would relate this to the intent of the great solar consciousness, which we are a part of, the solar logos, and the intent that this great being has for all monads within its evolutionary realm. I would also bring in the uh, attempts of the planetary logos, which our higher selves are a part of, and its attempt to successfully function as a chakra or force center within the greater being. Now, Madame Blavatsky informs us that the mystery language of Senza, which forms the basis of the stanzas of Jeanne, the core of the secret doctrine, is the secret sacerdotal tongue from the words of the divine beings who dictated it to the sons of light in Central Asia at the very beginning of the fifth, our race. For there was a time when its language, the Senza, was known to the initiates of every nation. Now, commenting upon the language of Senza, John Algeo states, the mystery language is now what we call symbolism. It speaks to our unconscious minds and can only be imperfectly translated into ordinary logical language. John Algeo made a distinction here in terms of two aspects of symbolism, one being uh, pictographs and hieroglyphics, and the other being the symbolism, symbolism is mythic and folk tales. So mythology then is a representation of archetypal energies, which form part of a great evolutionary design. And the symbolism of myth contains within it the wisdom and insights of previous cultures who have sought to understand, to access, and to utilize the energies of the archetypes, portraying these by their various deities and mythic characters. Here, the unconscious content of the archetypes underlying the great tales of myth was consciously elaborated by various storytellers and bards. This occurring within the context of their own existential psyche, their own psychic interpretation, but also, of course, conditioned by the tradition and the collective psyche of their particular tribe or civilization. Here was an image of Jean Houston, scholar, philosopher, and one of the principal founders of the human potential movement. Houston states, a myth is something that never was, but is always happening. This succinct and most apposite statement fully encapsulates the nature of myth as a representation of the energies of the archetypes. These divine ideas being fundamental to humanity and our spiritual growth. Here is an image of Mount Olympus. The Greeks used the exalted heights of this mountain to symbolize the transcendental location of the archetype, these hovering over humanity, conditioning and influencing our lives. In the time of classical Greece, the upper regions of the sky could not be reached by physical human endeavor. And the ever-changing conditions of the sky were held to represent the eternal flux of creation. The supreme Olympian Zeus embodies law and justice, and he punishes transgressors with his thunderbolts, this alluding to the great law of karma. Now, Madame Blavatsky, in The Secret Doctrine, spoke of five ways by means of which we may interpret mythic symbolism. She labeled these as spiritual, astronomical, psychical, physiological, and anthropological. She later went on also to mention mythic symbolism in terms of theogony and anthropogeny. So today we're looking at myth 
from a psycho-spiritual perspective in terms of the treading of the spiritual path. And it's important to bear in mind when we engage with the content of the hero myths, we gain an understanding of what is probably best referred to as the hero archetype. And in doing so, we may then express or be assisted in expressing the necessary heroic qualities relating to the treading of the path. And more so because myths are represent representations of archetypes, we attune to the energy reservoirs created by those precious members of humanity who have gone before us. We access these energy fields and more than this, we donate to them, making it easier for those who follow. This all being in accord with Rupert Sheldrake's concept of morphic resonance. It's very important to bear in mind, of course, we are all instruments of the higher self and all the souls form part of the consciousness of the planetary logos. When we tread the path, we do it for humanity and for the planet. And Madame Blavatsky famously stated that when one treads the path, all that is good and all that is evil surface. And when we embark upon our spiritual journey, the adventures, the challenges, and the rewards symbolically described by the hero myths begin to surface in our lives in existential ways. And these characters found within the mythic landscape represent archetypal components inher inherent within each and every human psyche. And mythology gives us a map whereby we may explore, ascertain, and develop a conscious relationship to these archetypes, thereby assisting us in bringing about spiritual transformation. The heroes of myth are tested. They undergo many great tests and trials. And these represent archetypal stages in the process of spiritual transformation, where aspects of our psyche must be transformed, where echoes of our past must be negotiated, if we are to successfully unite with and express the intent of the higher self. And importantly, these challenges give us the opportunity to learn and to grow, not for the benefit of ourselves, of course, but for the benefit of uh, humanity and the planet. And when we consider the symbols of myth and also dream symbolism, we must be aware that these are dynamic and multivalent. They can be interpreted at different levels. And whilst the symbols of myth portray underlying archetypal themes, which are common to all of us, they will manifest in our own life and resonate within our psyche, our individual psyche, in an existential manner. Here's my book, which uh, Erica has uh, listed in the email very kindly and there's a link to my site if anyone's interested but i'm here to talk about the symbolism of myth per se not to sell my book uh, here is an image of heinrich zimmer an indologist mentor to joseph campbell the great 20th century student of myth zimmer had a close friendship with carl jung and he stated that the symbols found in myth and folk tradition function as everlasting oracles of life. They have to be questioned and consulted anew with every age, each age approaching them with its own variety of ignorance and understanding, its own set of problems, its own inevitable questions. For the life patterns that we today have to weave are not the same as those of any other day. The threads to be manipulated and the knots to be disentangled differ greatly from those of the past. The replies already given, therefore, cannot be made to serve us. The powers have to be consulted again directly, again and again and again. We must bear in mind we reside with, within and we interact within a living, dynamic, subjective, interconnected universe, which is ever evolving. It's in the state of perennial flux. And whilst we possess certain attributes that our forebears lacked in the terms of wonderful developments in psychology, 
we must remain mindful that we will never produce definitive answers to the symbolism of myth, and nor must our insights ever become crystallized and function as dogma. Rather, we view our insights as a source of inspiration towards fulfilling the requirements of the quest. Symbolism, the symbolism in myth will adapt itself to our own requirements, to the requirements of our age, but it will do the same thing for successive generations. And this offers humanity the opportunity to draw down deeper and deeper insight and inspiration via attunements to the archetypes represented in myth. Now let's look at what we refer to in theosophy as the way of the monad and its relationship to Greek myth. So theosophy informs us that in essence, we are monads, indivisible sparks of the one flame divine, and that our entire solar system is a manifestation of this immense being, which we commonly refer to as the solar logos. And this great being can only evolve through the evolution of its component parts, the monads. It thereby projects the monads down the various planes of consciousness as part of a vast evolutionary process. And the objective of the monad's long evolutionary journey is to acquire what the wisdom teachings refer to as spiritual staying power. This referring to the ability of the monad to unfold its hitherto latent qualities and to express these amidst the constraints of consciousness below it the densest and most challenging of these levels, of course, being the physical. And there are many myths which describe the projection of spirit into matter and also the dual nature of humanity. In Greek myth, Zeus, the supreme Olympian, unites in intercourse with Persephone to produce his son Dionysus. And Zeus intends for his offspring to succeed him as the ruler of the cosmos. However, his jealous wife Hera incites the Titans, the generation of divine beings whom the Olympians have succeeded, to kill Dionysus and cut him into pieces. The Titans provide Dionysus with a set of toys, including a mirror, and the young gods, god becomes enamored with his own reflection, and then the Titans seize and dissect him boiling and roasting his bodily parts, consuming these with the exception of the heart, which is rescued by the goddess Athena. This enables Zeus to then engineer the rebirth of Dionysus through union with the mortal Semele. In one version of the myth, Zeus then strikes the Titans with a thunderbolt. The symbolism of this talk, we could, well, this myth, we could cover it in an entire talk, but basically Zeus is representative of our monadic essence, and Dionysus is the higher self, the Christ child within. And when we embark upon the spiritual path, we seek to connect with the Christ child within, express its intent on behalf of the Father in heaven. When creation manifests, there is duality. The absolute is differentiated into antagonistic, but also cooperative pairs of opposites, which are in essence as one. Here is the Indian symbolism of the lingam penetrating the yoni, the transcendent principle what we would call parabram, pouring out its energies into the womb of creation, this is what we refer to as the hieros gamos, our sacred marriage, which creates and sustains our very universe. And when we tread the spiritual path, we are seeking to recreate this sacred marriage in microcosm. Now, this is symbolized in many of the Greek hero myths. The, the earliest of the Greek heroes, Cadmus, he unites with his wife, Harmonia, the first wedding attended by the Olympians, the archetypes. Heracles, after his immortal body ascends from the funeral pyre, transmutation by fire, he ascends to Olympus and he affects a hieros gamus with Hebe, the daughter of Hera. Perseus, after decapitating Medusa, rescues Andromeda from uh, the sea creature Cetus. 
affecting the higher risk gammas. They are then elevated to the constellations, transcendence. Odysseus returns home to the father's house, his father Laertes, and he reunites with his wife Penelope, another representation of this. Now, the goddess factor, as described in myth, is operative in all levels of creation below that of the first cause. If I could have found a decent uh, diagram of the cosmic points, I would have chosen that. But uh, for simplicity's sake, we'll stick with this. The goddess is a representation of the divine feminine. And it is within the realm of the goddess that we as monads undertake our long evolutionary journey, seeking to acquire spiritual staying power. The goddess symbolizes the active power of the divine in manifestation. It is her energies which imbue all forms with life. She is all embracing. She functions as the agent of transformation. On the microcosmic level, her counterpart is found within every woman and is the god in every man. The various female figures in myth are representations of the goddess in some shape or form. Now, Joseph Campbell, the great 20th century student of myth, he would frequently state that the goddess symbolizes all that can be known. And her secrets, the secrets of the goddess, to which she holds the keys, are those of life itself, lying beyond the opposites of manifestation in all categories of mind and thought. And when we tread the path, we must be aware that the goddess guards her secrets very jealously. It is only when we overcome the various tests and trials of the path, as symbolized in the lives of the Greek heroes, whereby we are then able to perceive her secret. This requires us to possess a very high degree of psychological integration and to have off, off loaded the necessary karma, which is accumulated over our many lives. So to penetrate what HPB referred to as the veil of Isis, we must undergo the necessary rites of passage. And the goddess casts her veil over creation, whereby the, the one life appears as many separate and distinct lives in this transient world, and its everyday affairs appears to the human mind as real and enduring. Now in myth, especially Greek myth, the relationship between the hero and the goddess, representing the interaction between the spiritual aspirant and manifest creation, is an instrumental factor in the way of the monad, whereby the soul is able to unfold its symbolic lotus petal. Here we see an image of Zeus and Hera, given their Roman names, Jupiter and Juno. Hera is the consort of Zeus and is thus a symbol of deity and manifestation. Zeus and Hera represent these antagonistic but complementary opposites of manifestation. There are many marital quarrels between the two, and these depict the differences between spirit and matter and the masculine and feminine principles, which must be unified if one is to successfully tread the path. Here is an image of Hera beside the goddess Athena. These two are instrumental in the Greek hero ultimately attaining the objective, fulfilling the objectives of the request. Now Hera is a jealous goddess. She places many obstacles in the path of the heroes, especially Heracles. And these relate to the challenges of incarnation within the realm of the goddess, the planes of manifestation. However, these tests ultimately enable the monad to fulfill the requirements of evolution via the higher self. The higher self is seeking to learn every lesson that life and form has to offer and thereafter must extract itself from matter. And uh, in the process, its instrument, the personality, unfolds the symbolic petals of the soul through overcoming the many challenges related to treading the path. The goddess Athena is very important in the Greek hero myth. She's the goddess of civilization. 
a warrior goddess and the feminine personification of wisdom. She is the patron of many of the Greek heroes, Perseus, Heracles, Jason, and Odysseus. She gives them wise counsel and magical aids so that they may fulfill the requirements of the quest. So whilst we have Hera generally placing obstacles in the way of the heroes, Athena is assisting and inspiring the archetypal hero. And these things are going on simultaneously within the realm of the goddess. There are challenges, there is assistance from nature. In the voice of the silence, Madame Blavatsky states, help nature and work on with her, and nature will regard thee as one of her creators and make obeisance. And she will open wide before thee the portals of her secret chambers. Lay before thy gaze the treasures hidden in the very depths of her pure virgin bosom. Unsullied by the hand of matter, she shows her treasures only to the eye of spirit, the eye which never closes, the eye for which there is no veil in all her kingdoms. So whilst it is formless, theosophy symbolizes the soul, the higher self, is a lotus-like structure. Its evolutionary objective being to unfold its symbolic petals of knowledge, love, and sacrifice. And first of all, the soul must become immersed in the circumstances of the material world. The Hindus call this the pravriti marga, or path of desire. Desire enables the soul to get fully involved, fully immersed in matter. But there is a certain point when it reaches a saturation in terms of acquiring experience in material form. Then the personality, as the mechanism of the soul, experiences what we refer to as divine unrest, where everyday life and its transient affairs no longer satisfy nor sustain one. And when the soul reaches this crucial juncture of its long evolutionary journey, the personality as its instrument is driven towards a spiritual path, what the Hindus call the Nivriti Marga, or path of renunciation. And I'm sure we have all undergone this archetypal experience in our own existential way, perhaps through the loss of employment, the breakdown of a marriage, financial difficulty, or in my case, just sheer disillusionment uh, with the life I was leading. And that is when the quest begins effectively, when we then begin to make efforts to journey back to the source of our being. And when we do so, we must emulate the courage of the mythic hero as we venture into the mythic landscape of our subjective psyche. In his work, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell describes how the heroes respond to what he refers to as the call to adventure. This clarion call, which, in our, which uh, is representative of the, of the work of the higher self, calling one within, corresponds loosely to the first initiation of the wisdom teaching, as the monad is beckoning one towards a spiritual path. We see a number of examples of this in Greek myth. Cadmus is exhorted to locate and escort his sister Europa back to Tyre after she is abducted by Zeus. Perseus requests the treacherous Polydectes to name a gift. He has invited people to a banquet in honor of the princess uh, Epidamia, and they are supposed to bring horses as a gift. Perseus has no gift to Bring, so he impetuously offers to uh, acquire the head of Medusa. Theseus is informed of his royal heritage by his mother, Aethra, and he unearths his uh, father's uh, sword and sandals from under a rock, rather like the Arthurian legend or grail legend of Galahad taking the sword from the stone, and he ventures on the challenging route whereby he must overcome six arch villains before meeting his father. Heracles is driven mad by Hera and slays his wife and children. And to expiate his crime, he must perform various labors set by his cousin, King Eurystheus. 
call to adventure. So Campbell describes the subjective landscape of the psyche as distant and dangerous lands into which the hero ventures, i.e. unexplored territory. They venture into these lands as a means of fulfilling the requirements of the quest. Campbell talks of three fundamental stages, separation, separation from the rank and file of humanity. The hero then undergoes many tests and trials, as does the spiritual aspirant. When these tests have all been overcome, initiation occurs, and then the hero returns to the rank and file of humanity, offering the lessons of their illumination to others as an act of service. And within the mythic landscape, the hero undergoes the entire spectrum of adventure, as does one who embarks upon the spiritual path. There are undulating circumstances between tragedy and triumph. These are experienced by the hero within the mythic realm, just as these occur within the life of the spiritual aspirant. When treading the path, one shall almost inevitably plumb the depths of the psyche in order to later experience the ineffable glory and bliss of the higher self. So the tests and trials of the hero then represent challenges imposed upon the spiritual aspirant, occurring amidst the surfacing of their karma, both difficult and favorable. But it is these adventures wrought within the crucible of the human psyche which promote psychological integration and enable the personality to demonstrate its worthiness as an instrument of the soul and thereby be infused with its energy. So there are many characters portrayed within the mythic landscape. There are gods which assist the hero, gods and goddesses which obstruct the hero, goddesses which assist the hero. There are fearsome dragons and monsters, arch villains, tempters, temptresses, false teachers, wise old men, wise old crones, divine messengers, beautiful maidens. And these are all metaphors for aspects of the human psyche. Now, the initiation and return stages of Campbell's journey accord primarily with the third initiation of theosophy, where one has scaled the symbolic mountain of initiation and is rewarded with insight into the intent of the planetary logos, the planetary consciousness. And then one goes into the world as a means of fulfilling that intent. Campbell states, a hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces there are encountered and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow men. Now the Greeks symbolize this in various ways. Cadmus, after overcoming uh, this Ismenian dragon, a symbol for the dweller on the threshold, he constructs a citadel of Thebes and he introduces the Phoenician alphabet to the Greeks. Perseus, after slaying Medusa and rescuing Andromeda, founds the city of Mycenae. After vanquishing the Minotaur, Theseus unifies Attica under the rule of Athens. Heracles, after completing his 12 labors, he assists the Argonauts on their quest for the Golden Fleece. Now, in Greek myth, it's very common for the protagonist to possess either a divine father or lineage and an earthly mother. Examples of this include Cadmus, Perseus, Heracles, Theseus, Jason, and Bellerophon. And this represents our essential duality. And as I said earlier, treading the path is all about affecting the hieros gamos and unifying these opposites. Now, the European school, the theme is the mystery of consciousness. Of course, consciousness arises through the interplay between these opposites of spirit and matter. And Carl Jung describes consciousness as a Promethean conquest. And a consideration of the symbol, symbolism rather, of the myth of the crucified Titan is most revealing. 
Here we have the Titan Prometheus, who in some traditions is credited with the creation of humanity from clay. Now Zeus allocates him the task of supervising the separation of sacrificial meat, deciding which parts to give to the Olympians and which to allocate to humanity. The gods and humanity have previously eaten together, but now they must eat apart. Of course, this symbolizing the descent of spirit into matter, where humanity is separated from the causal realms of being. Prometheus engages in an act of deception. He slays a large ox and divides it into two piles. He covers the ox meat with the animal's stomach and defiles the bones with the animal's fat. He invites Zeus to choose between the two packages, and Zeus chooses the pile of bones. As an act of revenge, the enraged Olympian then withholds fire from humanity, but Prometheus steals it back, restoring it to the human kingdom. Zeus is further enraged, and as punishment, Prometheus is chained to a rock in the Caucasus, where a vulture pecks at his liver each day, it heals at night, then the same thing starts the next day. So symbolically, human consciousness descends from communion with the gods into matter, as symbolized by Prometheus. The vulture pecking at the liver is representative of this spiritually excruciating effect of the five senses upon one who is governed by instincts and desires and not effectively harnessed to the intent of the soul. And when we seek to effect spiritual transformation, we must release our subjective Prometheus, whereby we may access a spiritual fire on the burning ground of initiation. Madame Blavatsky states that the Promethe Prometheus myth, even, belongs in truth to the dawn of human consciousness. The crucified Titan is the personified symbol of the collective Logos, the host, and the lords of wisdom, or the heavenly man who incarnated in humanity. Moreover, as his name, Prometheus, meaning he who sees before him, or futurity shows, in the arts he devised and taught to humanity, psychological insight was not the least. He proceeds to state, the Titan is more than a thief of the celestial fire. He is a representation of humanity, active, industrious, intelligent, but at the same time ambitious, which aims at equaling divine powers. In Greek myth, it is Heracles who frees Prometheus from his torment. The conclusion of the Heracles myth results in the hero mounting a funeral pyre prior to the immortal aspect of his being ascending to Olympias, where, as I said earlier, he realizes the highest gamos through his union with Hebe, the daughter of Hera. So let's have a brief look at the Hercules myth. Heracles myth, sorry, getting mixed up with the Roman. Heracles means Hera's glory, the spiritual aspirant. That is what we do when we tread the path. We are seeking to attain the glory of the goddess. And uh, Hera would often torment Heracles, placing these many obstacles in, in his way. But of course, this is part of uh, the monad's long journey, and this enables the monad ultimately to acquire spiritual staying power. The Heracles is driven mad and slays his wife and children, heroes behind this. Zeus advises the Delphic Oracle to inform Heracles that he must perform 10 labors at the command of his cousin, King Eurystheus, these later being increased to 12. So here we have Zeus as the monad, Heracles as the spiritual aspirant, 12 labors are commonly assigned to incarnation in the 12 signs and the zodiac upon the final round of the zodiac, what the wisdom teachings refer to as the cardinal cross. Eurystheus symbolizes the human personality he hides within a protective urn when Heracles approaches after successfully completing his various labors. He orders a herald to inform Heracles of his next task. And Eurystheus is symbolic of the personality bereft of courage, 
and spiritual qualities. It is only by undertaking the disciplines of the path, meditation, study, service, and being aware of our immortal nature that we develop the courage to proceed on the path. The cowardice which grips Eurystheus, there is a correspondence here with that of Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, before, of course, the discourse of uh, Krishna in uh, chapter two of that classic work. One of the labors of Heracles is to overcome the Nemean lion, the lion being a symbol of the personality. Heracles chases the lion into a cave and chokes it. Spiritual transformation occurs within. It is not seen by those in the outer world. This is a subjective thing. Heracles must flay the lion and wear its cloak. By overcoming the personality, the, effect, the physical body is then truly an effective cloak for the soul, not just in terms of metaphysical teachings, but as an actual metaphysical fact. There is the labor where Heracles must overcome the hydra. One of the symbols of what we call the dweller on the threshold, the various personality attributes which have accumulated over our many lives including our fears and repressed and undesirable characteristics. Some versions of the myth say that Heracles sinks to his knees and holds the creature up to the light, holding the lower nature up to the higher self so it withers away. Another version of the myth says he cuts off the eight heads which are not immortal and his nephew Iolaus cauterizes them strength of will in treading the path. One of the Hydra's heads is immortal. Heracles in both versions buries it under a rock. This informs us of the danger of the energies of the lower astral plane and that how we must by purity of vibration through our spiritual practices remain free from their effects. There is another wonderful labor symbolically where he must capture the Serenian hind, symbol of the intuition. The hind resides within the forest, forest of the unconscious. The hind is gentle, innocent, and very elusive. Of course, in terms of the chakra, the deer is associated with the heart chakra. And of course, it is here where we are tuned to the buddhic plane, where the faculty of intuition uh, is found. Heracles, in his penultimate labor, must obtain the golden apples of the Hesperides, the fruits of Atma, Buddhi, and Manas. There is wonderful symbolism in, the, in this myth. Prior to the tree appearing, he must assist the Titan Atlas by supporting the world on his shoulders, this alluding to the additional planetary karma which the initiate must take on, rather like the symbolism of the Christ. Uh, down for the sins of humanity. The conclusion of the myth is where Heracles and his wife Deoneria are crossing a river and the lustful center Nessus tries to violate Heracles's wife. Heracles uh, shoots the center with one of uh, his poisoned arrows picked from the blood of the Hydra. As he is dying, the vengeful center gives his shirt to Deoneria and says, give this to Heracles to wear so that his affections will never stray. So Deoneria, believing this, gives Heracles the shirt. He puts it on and it, it is excruciatingly painful. It is ripping his skin off as if the soul cannot stand the experience in matter anymore. So Heracles requests that a funeral pyre be built which he climbs onto and his immortal body sends to Olympus where he marries Hebe. This is of course the fire of initiation. When we tread the path, we draw down the solar fire of mind, eventually leading to the descent of electric fire, the fire of the monad, which coaxes the Kundalini serpent up the spine. Obviously a very potted version of the Heracles myth. And briefly, if I could say a little bit about Perseus. Uh, one point of the myth, 
King Polydectes, the king of Seraphos, is lusting after Danae, that's the mother of Perseus, and he calls a banquet for Princess Hippodamia, where the guests are advised to bring horses. Perseus, without a gift to bring, volunteers to bring the king the head of Medusa, whose image we see here. Medusa has protruding teeth and tongue, and the hair is comprised of writhing snakes. The gaze directly upon her countenance turns one to stone. And this encounter represents the darkest and most terrifying aspects of the monad's evolutionary journey within the realm of the goddess. And when we tread the path, we must confront both the terrifying collective aspects of human existence but also the very darkness within our own psyche. And of course, the effects of such a confrontation can be petrifying and overwhelming. The Jungian analyst, Eric Neumann, uses the term great mother to describe the goddess factor, which I have been referring to. He emphasizes that the great mother possesses a devouring aspect, which he refers to as the terrible mother. On the subject of Medusa, he states, the petrifying gaze of Medusa belongs to the province of the great goddess, but to be rigid is to be dead. This effect of the terrible stands in opposition to the mobility of the life stream that flows in all organic life. It is a psychic expression for petrification and sclerosis. The Gorgon is the counterpart of the life womb. She is the womb of death or the night sun. There is quite a close correspondence here with the symbolism of the Hindu Kali, one of Shiva's consort. And of course, the spiritual aspirant must be aware that the destruction of forms and all that this entails frees the indwelling life to more suitable forms. This is an ongoing process which can, to the uninitiated, look cruel and merciless. And when we tread the path, we must elevate our consciousness so that we realize this. And Athena assists uh, Perseus by giving him a mirror shield, whilst uh, Hermes, a symbol for the cycle pomp, provides him with a sword to decapitate the Gorgon. Now, the symbolism of the shield is most revealing. In astrology, we have Virgo and Pisces. Pisces rules the unconscious. The Gorgons reside within a cave, symbol of the unconscious. Virgo is the sign of self-analysis, purity, and refinement. It is also the sign of mother and child, i.e. Mary and Jesus, Isis and Horus, and so on. And it is through these processes of purification that we can give birth to the Christ child. Now, the Hindus often refer to the personality symbolically as a mirror, and for the light of the immortal aspect of one's being, what they call the Atman, to shine on the mirror, it must be cleansed of what they refer to as vasanas or attributes carried over from previous lives through what are called samskaras. And these vasanas give rise to vrittis or thoughts intertwined with desires. So spiritual development symbolically relates to this cleansing process. And when we are sufficiently purified, we are then able to ascend to higher levels of consciousness and not before. It is the cleansing of the mirror shield which enables Perseus to view Medusa and to decapitate her. There is a very famous quote from HPB, in, again from Voice of the Silence, which states, Beware lest thou should set a foot still soiled upon the ladder's lowest rung. Woe unto one who dares pollute one rung with miry feet. The foul and viscous mud will dry, become tenacious, then glue one's feet unto the spot. And like a bird caught in the wily fowler's line, one will be stayed from further progress. One's vices will take shape and drag one down. One's sins will raise their voices like as the jackals laugh and sob after the sun goes down. One's thoughts become an army and bear one off a captive slave. So Perseus then uh, confronts Medusa 
decapitates the Gorgon, and then the winged horse Perseus emerges, symbolic of the capacity to obtain flights of consciousness to soar to the plains of Atma, Buddhi, and Manis, or the symbolic Olympian height. Also, the horse Pegasus strikes the ground with his hoof, and this gives rise to the Pyrian spring, the spring of the muses, who inspire all great creative people. This is another symbol for the plains of Atma, Buddhi, and Manas. We are then informed that Perseus rescues Andromeda from a sea monster, this again alluding to the overcoming of the dweller, and they later marry, affecting the Hylus Gamos. And after inadvertently slaying the tyrant Acrisius, Perseus founds the city of Mycenae, and then he and his wife and her mother Cassiopeia are elevated to the constellations, of course, the symbol of a transcendent realm of being. Now, to conclude, we, I would suggest that we be mindful that these tests and trials of the mythic heroes appear in our own lives under different guises. These may be mirrored in our family life, at our work, in acts of service to humanity most certainly, perhaps even in our interactions with others within the society. And we must always remain aware and view these situations as opportunities to grow. And just like the mythic heroes, it's important to bear in mind, and I'm a master of this, or have been, if we sidestep a challenge in our life, a challenge, our challenging archetypal scenario, it is most likely to reappear again, but under a different guise. Fear is anathema to the aspirant solar plexus chakra. Rather, we must cultivate the courage of the heart chakra, view challenges as opportunities to learn and grow for the benefit of humanity. Are we to adopt the role of Heracles, seeking to fulfill the intent of the higher self, or that of his cowardly cousin, Eurystheus, who's hiding within the urn? HBB famously states, thou canst not travel on the path before thou hast become the path itself. It is the experiences along the way that result in our spiritual development and elevations in our consciousness. This is important. And it's also important to bear in mind that in a few of his labors, Heracles undergoes partial failure. This informs us that we do not set out on the path as a finished article. Rather, it is by confronting the challenges and learning from them that we develop and grow, connect more closely to the soul, and on this basis, become more effective instruments of service for humanity and the planet. So that is my talk today. I'd like to thank Erica for all the hard work in arranging this and inviting me. I'd like to thank Kat for her lovely introduction. And I also wish to convey my gratitude to everyone in attendance today who has come along uh, to listen to this talk. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gary, for such a wonderful lecture. Um, could you please unshare your screen? Uh, yeah, let me just um, stop share. Is that it? Yes, thank you so much. Before opening for questions, um, I would like to say that I have shared on the chat a link to Gary's book, Greek heroes meets symbols of transformation so if you would like to get a copy you can click there and order a copy for you um thank you so so much gary for you know i i, I have met gary in 2012 when i was at the Theosophical Society in England, giving the Blavatsky lecture, and Gary was conducting a seminar on the myths. This is his specialization apart from astrology. So I am always very much inspired by his lectures on this subject. Before opening for questions, I would like to say uh, that next Wednesday, we will have a lecture at 8 p.m. London time. 
the lecture is entitled Memories of Dora Kunz by Edward Abdiel. This is going to be a very special lecture in which he will be sharing with us uh, his experiences uh, uh, with Dora Kunz and the work that the healing work that she was doing. Um, and next Sunday, we will have a lecture on consciousness in its two principal aspects, ab absolute and individual, by William Quinn. Uh, William Quinn, is, he gives a very deep lectures on theosophy, and, and his work will inspire all of you. And having said that, uh, I want to say that uh, our last, last lecture, this year will be on the 13th of December. And then when we close uh, this year's work of the European School of Theosophy, we have we will have reached the number of 50 live lectures. Um, and this is a great work. And we, we are very working very hard for this to happen. Every Sunday we are here. I no, long, no longer have weekends with my family, as you can imagine. So, but you know, Rada Bournier, the international president of the Theosophical Society, once I once asked her if she ever take holidays. She told me that when we do something that we love, we don't really need to take holidays. And I replied to her, but God, after the seventh day, he did took holidays. He didn't take holidays. So we all need some rest. And hopefully we will, we will at the school be able to rest in December, from December onward. So we are very grateful for all of you here who are following our work, who are supporting us, the speakers, and for all of you being here, and especially for the team that we have formed now at the European School of Theosophy, Juliet, Taps, and so many others. So thank you so much. And thank you so much, Gary, for your wonderful and very inspiring speak, uh, speak uh, lecture. So I'm opening for questions now. Taps, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm handing over to you. I, there was already a question. I think Gary is already answering on the chat. So. <laughs> oh, yes, there was another one. Perhaps I was a bit impolite. I saw a question about relating the unconscious concept of Jung to the seven planes. Yes. I'm happy to answer that one. I, I, I did mention uh, to email me, but no. Looking at that one, Jung's unconscious. I, I do feel there's a bit, a slight problem with Jung's work in that he doesn't demarcate between the various planes when he talks of the unconscious. Whereas Robert, Robert Asajoli, who is a friend of Jung's and of course, very much influenced by theosophy, he spoke of a superconscious, a middle unconscious and a lower unconscious. But Jung's unconscious, he's really talking at the various various planes. Uh, but as to Jolie, the superconscious aspect of the unconscious is Atma Buddhi Manas plus the monad itself. Then there is the middle unconscious, which is within the psyche, which is predominantly astral mental, and the lower unconscious, which is predominantly, of course, lower astral, where we have the id the shadow which the dweller is particularly adept at utilizing. But in terms of theosophy, Jung's archetypes in their pure form within the human psyche, obviously stream from the monad and they are first expressed at the level of Atma, Buddhi and Manas, the evolutionary intent as a divine idea. But then humanity responds to these energies in terms of its well, each individual responds to it in terms of its own evolution. And when we respond to archetypes, we create our own as well. So we have all these energy reservoirs, astral mental levels, as well as at, as at the higher levels. We, when we tread the path, we seek to attune to the archetypes in their pure form, i.e. Atma, Buddhi and Manas. 
I don't, I mean, in my opinion, what Jung is doing new is the fact that he is, that is new and inspired is relating archetypes to symbolism. And of course, the great initiates have undergone revelations through the perception of symbols. That is what is important. I feel that augments our paradigm in certain ways. But similarly, I think theosophy plays a very important role as a key towards interpreting concepts by Jung and uh, the many great uh, other great analysts who have followed in his footsteps. Is that a, who asked the question that I can? Yes. Let's go. It was me, Gary. Thank you, Liz. Liz is, Liz is my friend, yeah. <laughs> can we can ask... talk about it on Skype. Yes, Graham, you can have the word. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, two questions. One, is your talk loosely based upon the book so that we'll find the various quotes um, and references in the book? And a more specific question, yeah. it seems obvious that there should be 12... Um, labors of Hercules to connect with the Zodiac. So why do you think there were originally 10? Okay, uh, the first one's an easy answer. Yes, the quotes, I think apart from one of the Voice of, Silence, Voice of the Silence ones are all in my book, and of course there are many more. Yes, Alice Bailey, as you probably know, wrote a book entitled The Labors of Hercules, where she wrote- I have it, yeah. yeah. She does not follow the labors in their traditional order, far from it. And I, I believe, having read the book, and, be, and I'm, a, I'm a fan of it also, that some of the labors symbolically perfectly describe the challenges of uh, incarnation for the soul and the path in a particular sign, whereas others I find the connections a little bit tenuous. Uh, in terms of why, that is a very good question because there were originally 10, because Heracles' nephew, Iolaus, assisted him in overcoming the Hydra, and because when he cleansed the Aegean stables, he diverted the course of two rivers, in each case, Eurystheus argued that he hadn't completed the labor of his own accord. And thereafter, there were 12. Uh, I can't really comment in terms of why 10, then 12. 12 fits the zodiac perfectly. I'm not aware of there ever having been uh, 10 zodiacal signs. I'm not an expert on the history of astrology. My astrological work is more about relating the individual to the higher self. So I, I can't give you a definitive yeah. answer at all there, Graham, I'd have to say. Uh, what I would yeah. suggest, the way I approach myth is uh, perhaps write it in a spiritual diary and ponder on, on it. See how you feel when you're drifting off to sleep and see what dreams you have. See what the myth means to you. Yes. Myth Let's isn't going it. to lay out every fact to us. It's going yeah. to offer us symbolism where we can engage with and understand more of, a, of our own psyche, both the lower aspects and very importantly, the higher ones. I'm digressing. I appreciate that. Yeah. So, do you remember which two have been omitted um, when it was ten? Which which are the two new ones? Do you do you know? Yeah, the uh, apples of the Hesperides and the uh, Cerberus one, where he descends to take Cerberus out of hell. They're the they're the last, but the normal order. I'll have to go read from my book, but the Nemean lion is the first rather than the fifth in the Bailey book, and the Hydra is the second. You know, that's how they begin. I still think, I mean, Bailey's work actually inspired me to a certain extent in terms of getting interested, developing an interest in the Greek myths. I'm not knocking it in any shape or form, but I, I firstly, I didn't want to repeat what someone else had said. And secondly, as I delved into the myth more, I saw that she had taken a very different course. And also, I believe that book was compiled posthumously. I believe those were originally individual articles in Alice Bailey's journal. Uh, was it called The Beacon? Correct me if I'm wrong. 
but th that was then then the the book was compiled so she may have only been looking at each labor individually in terms of its symbolism anyway yeah thank you thank you i'm sorry i couldn't <laughs> that's fine that's fine it's very illuminating thank you thanks graham i'm glad you enjoyed it uh, I have a question. If there is, is there any other question? Uh, no, you can go, Erica. Thank you, um, Gary. Um, regarding the myth of harmony, harmony and Cadmus, you mentioned it. Uh, Briefly, yeah. Their wedding was the first wedding uh, yeah. among the the the, the Olympian, Olympian and Olympian yeah, they were all present. Yeah. And their way, wedding took place at uh, the Samothrace Islands. And the Samothrace Islands, you know, I gave a lecture in Scotland about it, you might remember. You did, I remember it very well. Yeah. The Samothrace Island is the island of the Caverian Mysteries. And oh, one very important, uh, let's say, object in the Caverian Mysteries was a ring so they were giving to the initiate a ring with a number of symbols it is believed actually the mother of alexander the great olympia she met filippo and in, uh, in the summertrace islands and um, it is said that the cavilian mystery mysteries blavatsky mentions it also is not only the oldest uh, mysteries, Hellenic mysteries, but also it was um, the, the mysteries were dedicated to the mystery of birth. So it had to do with couples. And then it said that the tradition of the wedding ring is coming from actually from the mysteries from the Caverian mysteries and it's very oh. interesting because the wedding of Harmonia in Cadmus was in Samothrace and then I wanted to share this info with you again because you probably forgot I mean my lecture was like ages ago in Scotland um, but yeah I think it was about seven years ago or yeah or yeah <laughs> yes so what is your uh, opinion on the symbolism of the wedding of uh, um, Harmonia and Cadmus in relation to this background I just mentioned, which HPB also mentions about yeah. it, this even doctor. Okay, thank you very much, Erica, for sharing that. Uh, I have a number of friends in Bulgaria, as you know, and uh, they run an annual, they have an annual yoga holiday in Samothrace, and I keep saying I will visit one year. I see the pictures, and it looks absolutely amazing. Uh, with all the Olympians present, I take it to be rather like the third initiation where all the archetypes are there. As Jung said, upon attaining individuation, the higher initiation, then uh, one has, can consciously access and express the archetypes. I would say the Olympians being present, it's like it's like Moses receiving the tablets of law. One is aware of the archetypal forces which play this instrumental role in the evolutionary design for our planet, and one is effectively aligned to them. A ring is Leo, fifth house, very what Jung called wholeness, unification of conscious, unconscious, and so on. In the Cadmus myth, after the marriage, of course, the house of Cadmus suffers a lot of mid misfortune. And similarly, Theosophy talks of the fourth initiation and all personality desires, etc., being renounced. They all get stripped away. And the conclusion of the myth, uh, Cadmus and Harmonia have tired of life. They wish to be transformed into serpents. And, you know, very scorpionic transformative symbol, alluding thereafter to the phoenix when they transcend to the Elysian fields and immortality. But I would, I would kind of liken the wedding of Cadmus and Harmonia to Odin ascertaining the secrets of the runes, having all the archetypes present. 
you, you develop this awareness of them. Thank you, thank you, Gary. I think there is. Yeah, Daryl has a question. Daryl, okay. Daryl, yeah. you have the word. Or unmute. Yes, uh, just a minute. After Taro, uh, Dino also has a question after Taro. Okay. Yeah. Taro needs to unmute. I thought. Hi. Yeah. We can uh, hear. I just. Hi, Gary. It was a wonderful. Hi, uh, nice to meet you. Hi. Nice, nice to meet you also. I'm from Mumbai, India. So yeah. when you were going through all these uh, myths and uh, everything, I could uh, visualize that every tradition has such myths wherein Very someone has so. become a hero and uh, uh, have passes there are three stages there was a chart there was a slide from you where you have shown three stages that initiation and then yeah. going through yeah. some hurdles basic, and yeah, come one. Ones, yeah so and since uh, i could just from our talks by erica also uh, could would know that since 7 to 12 years or more than that you are into this so have you ever tried to uh, combine all myths together and find some uh, some combination or some some relation between them. Like That's just now, uh, Erika showed the ring. In Indian tradition, it is a Mangal Sutra, which also yeah. has a uh, tradition and myth. Uh, so I, I was this, just wondering, yeah. these thoughts were coming. Yeah, yeah this of course was the work of Joseph Campbell, and he has the classic book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, i.e., demonstrating. Uh, the, the hero archetype is described in all the world myths. Uh, you know that that is basically what uh, what he was saying there. Because we're looking at the structure of the human psyche and the way it is designed, and obviously there are cultural differences between different parts of the world. But the perception of the hero's journey is is essentially the same. It is just. The characters may differ slightly in the scenarios because of the culture and experiences of that civilization. Joseph Campbell, very interestingly, and given your background, he was an academic who studied mythology, and he said it didn't really fit together until he went to the East, and particularly to India, and studied Vedanta, etc. And then it all made sense to him. That is, I mean. I mean, I'm basically try looking at it through theosophy, trying to fuse it with the ideas of Jung, Campbell, and, relate, and hopefully having a few of my own realizations. Uh, you know, that is what we do when we study the esoteric, or even if you're studying the Akashic records, you furnish your psyche with everything you know about the subject. You have all this imagery and information, and then you rely on subjective precipitations and insights. Uh, but I think studying uh, the myths of India, et cetera, would be wonderful. That, I mean, I found this work quite challenging, just taking down coherent versions of the stories and then setting about interpreting them. But uh, I, I do hope to do further work later in life, the grail legends being closer to home is one. But the Indian myths would be just fantastic. Uh, and of course, you have the Native American Indian ones, which uh, fascinate me as well. They're, they're, but, you know, as you say, if you look at them all, like Campbell did, say as a theosophist, you could look at the stages of the path and you, look, you can look at quotes from Voice of the Silence. Then if you have a decent library, of, you know, you could be then looking at these reflected in the various stories of world myth. It would be, be a wonderful project, certainly. Jungians actually tend to prefer fairy tales to myth because they say they don't have the cultural overlay, they're a bit purer, they're not so heavily tinged with the civilization. I mean, that's open to dispute, but I can see where they're coming from. A bit like tarot readers, they tend to prefer the traditional Marseille tarot rather than ones which have developed since. So. Uh, okay, Dino, you have Thank the you. word now. Thank you, Daryl. Dino, you need to unmute, unmute yourself. Yes. What? <laughs> Hi, Dino. Good to see you, my friend. I've met you many times. Always, always great to listen to you to this wonderful lecture that you know so much about these myths. It's really fascinating me. 
I, I just, you know, I just, as I was saying, that all through history, we all ask this, this great myths in order to teach men either to behave. And to be and to be good among among themselves and according to the, the story they got there by the myth, I, I also was was thinking, are myths similar to proverb and saying? I think the myth, the symbolism goes a bit deeper. I think the proverb is is a saying which can be very valuable. You, now, the proverb tends not to have symbolic characters. Mm -hmm. You know, it is just a statement of value. However, whether you're looking at a myth or a proverb, you ponder upon it deeply, and then aspects of your life begin to surface in this, you know, you have these realizations. So you can approach them the same way, in my opinion. But myth, of course, you have different characters and gods and villains. Whereas the proverb, proverb is less abstract, but very valuable also. That, that would be my, uh, and again, I always say we're treading the path, you find what is right for yourself. I mean, to me, theosophy is the best key for unlocking any of these teachings. That, that, is, my, that is my personal view. And, uh, uh, you know, it was given out as a key, you know, for our uh, Aquarian age, but, we remain open-minded as well. At some point, these teachings will be superseded. The sooner, the better, because then humanity will have grown even further. But yes, I mean, uh, proverbs are great. And less abstract, you can take a proverb and think how you're dealing with this in your life when this situation has arisen and so on. Uh, All right. Thank you, Gary. Thank That's you. okay, Dino. Great to see you as always, my friend. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Can I give the word now to Dave? Dave, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, thanks, Stubbs. Um, hello, Gary. Okay. Hi. Um, can you hear me all right? I can hear you very well. Are you going to enlighten me on English history again? You usually do that when we meet. <laughs> <laughs> No, no worries. <laughs> um, I, I purchased the Joseph Campbell book many years ago, uh, but it wasn't um, uh, of, uh, it wasn't to uh, understand the symbolism, but it was to I'd, I'd heard people recommend it in order to write stories because the the um, the symbolism of the hero and uh, refusing the, um, or, to, or to be given a task, but refusing the task, but having to do it anyway. And then in the end, coming back and helping people from, from his um, background, if you like. And um, anyway, I, I found it hard going, quite honestly. And, um, but I remember once I had a dream. Uh, I mean, most of my dreams are just bits of rubbish about this, that, and the other kind of filing system. Um, but um, a friend of mine uh, lost his mother, and he was very close to his mother. And he was asking me, I was in a pub one night, and he came around, he was, the barmaid tried to warn me, Laurie's mother had died. Uh, he's going to ask you what happens when you die. Where do you go to? And um, but he was on to me straight away, and he asked, you know, "What happens when you die? What happens to the soul? Is there a soul? Um, do you believe in heaven or hell or whatever?" And um, I couldn't, I couldn't really answer. I couldn't really answer it. I was about to say something about reincarnation, but I didn't really feel I knew, knew enough to convince myself, never mind him. And um, uh, and, I, and I said, I'm sorry, I don't know, and I don't think anybody else knows. Um, and he banged his empty glass on the bar and, and walked out. And um, anyway, uh, I was about to leave and he, 
came back again and uh, I said good night to everybody and uh, the barmaid said, Laurie's got you a drink in. So I went back to the bar, got the drink and um, Laurie came up, he said, you're the only one that told any truth. And, um, and then anyway, that night I had a dream, what I call a big dream, and there was lots of symbolism in it. And I, I feel that over the, over the time afterwards, a long time, I began to understand some of the symbolism, uh, but perhaps not all of it. And is it better to find out the symbolism for yourself? Or, I mean, in the West, people want to ask a psychologist or somebody like that, or a Jungian psychologist, is it better to find out for yourself? Or is it better to go and get help? I suppose it depends on one's background. I, personally, I would use the symbolism of esoteric astrology within the context of my own life to interpret yeah. a dream. Uh, again, I, I mean, my view of counselling has always been any, any form of counselling that the counsellor has the ability to enable the analysis to elicit the answer from within this themselves. They facilitate that. Uh, yes, yes. I mean, with symbolism, certain symbols in that dream may be different to you as they are to me, you know, yeah. depending on your life experiences, etc. Yes. You, yeah. you haven't said what the symbolism was. Uh, no, well, there was, a, well, I'll give you one or two things really uh, briefly. Yeah. Uh, briefly. Um, the dream starts where I have four sons, but only three of them are the, with me. And uh, the youngest one is not there. And we're in the jungle and we're, we've got machete, machetes and we're hacking our way through and we're trying to find a path. And I'm trying to keep the three boys with me because one's drifting off and there's no path, there's no ground. It's just rushing water this way, that way and the other. And all there are is roots of trees and we're we're walking via the roots of trees. And then okay, the, next, yeah. the next moment, we're on a, a tarmac path, perfect path. And we see a mountain ahead, a, a dark mountain, the sun on one side, the moon on the other. And there's a guy traveling up the mountain and he seems to be going um, two steps up, one step back. And my eye is like a telescope. <laughs> and it just clicks okay. in and I yep. see this guy and I say that's too dangerous and my oldest son is saying that's the way dad that's the way and, and I, I said no it's too dangerous and afterwards after the dream I realised that guy was myself uh, going up the dangerous route and um, then we traverse the mountain I find a a path, uh, a winding path going upwards. I said, that's the way to go. And I send the lads off there. Um, almost as that's the way I've got to bring them up and put them on the path somehow. And... Um, Do you, okay. Do you actually have four children or is this simply... Yes, I do. Yes. You do? Yeah. One... Because four is associated with Saturn and Capricorn in psychological integration. I immediately thought of the four Pevensey children in the line, the witch in the wardrobe. Well, you know, which is an initiation. Yeah, yeah. It is a symbol of initiation. You were in the equivalent of the forest of the unconscious. You were seeing the path ahead, the sun and moon, the alchemical raw wedding of the sun and moon. To me, it seems a dream about the spiritual path, things which have to be clear, the need to pro progress on the path, two steps up, <laughs> one down, it's challenging, but the importance of psychological integration because the sun was lacking. It was three out of four. Yeah. yeah. Just something to ponder on. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Dave, enjoyed that. Yeah. I think, is it Catherine? Somebody else has asked a question. I yeah, think. it's Catherine now. Catherine. 
that would be our last question. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Could you read the question, please, Taps? It's written on the chat. Catherine, okay, I'll read up the question. Gary, could you please expand or summarize upon the relationship between such myth astrology in general and the sort of astrology you practice relating the individual to their higher senses, please? Well, I think with both myth and astrology, what they have in common is pe people who are studying myth or the bards and storytellers and the astrologers are seeking to understand the forces which are operative in our, in our lives and within our psyche. The form of astrology I practice is primarily the astrology of the soul, although it can deal with practical matters most certainly, but it's essentially about linking the individual to the intent of the soul, the higher self. The, the soul has chosen a particular means of expression in accord with its long evolutionary history and in accord with the intent of the planetary logos. Uh, relationship between myth and astrology that there are, well, one of my friends here today, Liz, uh, who asked the question, we are planning to do some work on uh, myth and astrology, actually something to do in the future, which I'm very much looking forward to. But in each case, I'd say people are, in, from a different perspective, they're looking at a different spiritual key, which can uh, unlock what we would call the wisdom teachings and make them applicable to the age in which these people live. You know, astrology is one particular spiritual key, myth is another one, but they both relate to understanding the intent of uh, higher beings, the, the intent of the planetary and solar logos and beyond. You know, they're, they're just looking at, they're, they're seeking, well, they're seeking to achieve the same things, but in slightly different ways, but they're both, they both lend themselves very well to theosophy and also Jungian psychology, in my opinion. Yeah, thank you so much, Gary. Um, uh, Janet, Janet Lee suggested uh, that uh, we could create at some point uh, a group to, to discuss dreams. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. very interesting. Um, and then this is something for us to think about for 2021 as an uh, extra activity that we could do um, if we have persons like you, for example, and even Janet, who has a, Janet's uh, a Jungian, yeah. who knows a, a lot about Jung, you both, you both and, and some more other persons, you know, involved into it because it needs some knowledge. Um, Gary, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Again, please do support the work of Gary. And if you can, and if you are interested, and if you like and enjoy this presentation, you can get his book in the link I have posted on the chat. I will be including the link also in, uh, in the video that will be available on YouTube. We Theosophists should support each other. This is very important. We are not many around the world. Um, Gary, thank you so much. Thank you all of you for being here. Uh, Ta, I see that there is um, two wonderful couples I can see. One was uh, Jan Janet and Tony. Tony, it seems that he left a beard to, to grow, but he's no longer on the screen. And the other one is Ify and Tim. Hello to, to both of you. Um, Ingrid, uh, perhaps would you like to say something, darling? We miss you and we are not hearing much from you. Uh, Ingrid is the heart of the European School of Theosophy and yeah. Thank you, Erica. Uh, and thank you, Gary, for a, a really wonderful Thank lecture. you, Ingrid. Your book is signed and will be posted tomorrow morning. Thank <laughs> you. I received your order indeed. today. <laughs> yeah, your lecture is very much up uh, for my interest because I have been uh, interested in Jungian psychology. In fact, I have been to Jungian therapy. Um, so uh, I know well, that, a little that's bit, wonderful. little bit about it. And um, thank you for a very wonderful lecture. It was. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Ingrid. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, Ingrid. Uh, Juliet, would you like to say something? We have made a call for courses. Uh, uh, 
topic course. Would you like to say something uh, briefly about it, please? Yes, um, I've asked people if there's any topic that you would specifically like uh, for us to create a course uh, on or something similar, please take this advantage to uh, send those topics along, whatever it can be, it doesn't really matter, we'll look into it. Uh, several people have asked, of course, about the secret doctrine and uh, the heavier text, which we shall be looking into next year. There is a, a lot of, of new things on the burner for the European School of Theosophy, so I'm sure you'll all be excited by new things coming. But do continue with your support and interest, and it, it's heartwarming to see everybody turn up every week and um, show such enthusiasm. So thank you all. Look forward to, to seeing you next time. Thank you so much. Carlos, Carlos Nav Navarro, would you like to say a hi, something? Are you with your mic on there? What would you like? Carlos is, uh, he's in Caracas, Venezuela, and he actually bought a video camera just to be here with us. And so he can share, we can see him. We are so grateful, for Carlos, for, you know, we know how difficult and challenging is the situation uh, in Venezuela for everyone now. Venezuela is isolated from the world economically. And we are very glad to have you as the office here with us. Would you like, please, to say something? Yeah. Thank you, everybody for allowing me to participate here. Yes, uh, the situation in my country is a little bit hard, but uh, it's, uh, I enjoy very much uh, participating in the activities of the European School. So thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. And uh, he, Carlos, is, he will be joining the team of the European School of Theosophy, and he is very willing to help, and we are very grateful for him. Taps, we are close with you. I hand it to you. So thank you so much. If you would like to say something. And... I think a lot has already been said, and all beautiful words of gratitude all over for Gary. And it's it was amazing listening to Gary. It's always insightful. And I always go back after these lectures with a lot of reading to do, like a long list of to-do things. So thank you once again, everyone, for your time. And I'm deeply gr grateful to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you very much. I wish you all a nice week. I'm going to close the meeting. OK, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye. Gary, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Tops. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.